it's time for the full walkthrough of the two largest forts of Fortress Group Janovec. They belong to the outer defensive ring of Fortress Group Mordlin. They were constructed over several evolutions of fortress construction. One, Fort No. 4, from 1887, and the other, Fort No. 17, from 1912 to 1915. It was still under construction when Ludendorff's offensive struck Modlin and Warsaw. Fort No. 4 was built in 1883 to 1888, 100 meters north of the railway line. It was one of the forts of the first inner ring. It was created on the basis of the model plan of Russian forts from 1879. And as we're starting to explore some of the Polish forts, here's the first indication that we are closing in on something military. And for those of you who study barbed wire, well, you tell me what this is. We close in on this old fort that was built in the late 1800s by the Russians when they owned this piece of real estate. This gets to be interesting to see how they differ from the Prussians and the French. Well, so far the construction and red brick looks fairly identical to the Prussian forts. Although the first time the Prussians laid their hands on this was when they took it from the Russians in World War I. And there's a caponier, because we all love those. And before World War I it had been strengthened and reinforced by several outer rings. It's an artillery fort that also held infantry outside. So now we'll see what happened during World War II because that just magically happens to be missing from the historical accounts of the fort. I would say these were firing positions, but if these were firing positions, they were bricked up, which is kind of weird, to be honest. But there were firing positions and they were bricked up. That makes sense now. This was a very open door. As for the modifications, well, there were electricity here. The Polish army did occupy it in between the wars, so there will be some modification to have done to some extent. Somebody break this up to keep people like me out. Oh. No. They bricked it up because the tunnel behind it has actually been blown. Now these forts, when they were abandoned, it's entirely possible that the defenders blew up some of the important parts before the Germans took it. Hmm. Now my best bet on such a large and wide door would be for cannons have to be stored in here and rolled out here onto the ramparts which would put us on the inner of the fort with the moat on the outside as we crossed. So as we're admiring the brickwork on the other side of the entrance is the most important thing, the wartime toilets. I don't know what the hell that is or was. Right? I mean, wrong. Mm -hmm. This is not the, well, well, this is weird. This is different. There are electrical components sitting in here. This could have been a small generator house. I will rescind my previous thought of this being in a toilet. I think there was an electrical component to this. There could have been little generators sitting in here. And there's a little tunnel in here that seems to be leading. Now bricked up towards the fort. But 
that condensator down there. That ceramic. That's actually very interesting. And remember inside here is a tunnel that has collapsed. So we don't really know how far that extends into the dirt wall that is running in here. And this is the outer leading to the ditch outside. Ah, we have a thing. In the central part of the fort, small barracks for five rooms were located. They were placed a bit unusually for a Modlin fort, as they were placed right under the artillery embankment. A postern was led from the barracks to the central caponier in the moat. Now, this brickwork have taken quite a lot of damage. That looks like it is not indicative of just time but it looks very similar to western style forts depending of course on what this is this could be a caserne could also be a powder magazine Okay, there's I'm gonna go with this up in the barracks or a Cassandra type thing, more so than I would believe it to be a powder store. It's way too open for that, way too open for that, obviously. This must have been a barrack. Like a peacetime barracks. Huh. The back door is, the back wall is curving, which is interesting. Had quite a bit of electricity running on the walls. I would go with this, actually feels quite modern. If I didn't know any better, I would say this wall had been fragged somehow. The way this brick has been shredded. How far are we from uh, where the Warsaw Uprising took place? We're far from the center, aren't we? From, from the center of Warsaw? Yes. Uh, 40 kilometers. So there's nothing, no, no reason why there should have been any fighting or destruction taking place here during the Second World War. Here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the Germans fought with the Russians around here, I would assume. Or everywhere, I would assume. Same thing with the plaster peeled. Technical holders, electricity in the ceilings. And again, we don't know what this was used for during the Second World War. It's not unlike the Germans to have used this for anything from a prison or storage or production like they did so many others. Oh, what a nice little caserne area. Identical. I'm not entirely clear on what that is, except I'm pretty sure it has a electrical component to it. And the doors are pretty damn big. Speaking of electrical, there was electrical installed here. Now, when, by whom, or why? I do not yet know. It doesn't look like the traditional German setup of electrical. <laughs> Elevated floor or partition. Hmm. 
So this is some 430 meters by 200 meters. At least the original layout was. Oh, anyway, what have we here? We have a room. What have we here? We have another room. You would never have guessed. Interesting staggering of bricks. Lots of component for electrical on the walls. Hmm. Holders. And there was a heavy door. There was two heavy doors. That would actually extend all the way into the room. That's unproductive, but okay. Maybe the same as the case here. In which case, I would guess, yeah, there's some serious hinges going on here. And it looks like an electrical cable. Hmm. Maybe this brickwork had been put on later. And they just left the hinges. So this would actually have been almost like a gate. Notice this is a metal pipe. I'm, I'm gonna have to go with this, been a, at least at one point, a small ammunition storage for maybe rifle ammunition, maybe. That's interesting. Never seen an exit with a little indent like that. Here by that entrance from the barracks is this mound which would serve as a protective mound for the entrance. In later evolutions of forts you'd start seeing cement or steel walls kind of bunkers, protective entrances. Here this was just simply a dirt wall. And really a wide ditch. Seriously. There was also a caponier here somewhere. The moat in front had a brick counter escarpment, a retaining wall from the side of a potential enemy attack. In front of the infantry rampart, a carnot wall was built surrounding the entire fort. The moat was defended by caponiers and a central caponier at the junction of the shoulders and had connections to the interior of the fort by means of three independent posterns. To the right of the barracks, a postern was built to the infantry rampart with a powder magazine connecting with an ammunition elevator for the battle station for the artillery located on top. Closer to the front shoulders, two powder magazines were built symmetrically, connected to a postern leading under the embankments to the scarpen. These powder magazines partitioned a large area of the fort's courtyard. On the roof of the postern, on the artillery embankment, Combat positions were built, and an ammunition elevator connecting to the underground powder magazine. In the years 1889 to 1900, the brickworks were modernized and upgraded. So what did people write? Yeah, some, uh, some kind of uh, cities. What does that say? 18... Yeah. 188? Uh-huh. Could th This could be original, could it? No. Yeah. I guess, I mean, well, that dream I had about there being a staircase down from here has vanished. Here is no staircase. There used to be a room in there. There used to be a room in there. But at least here was a doorway. 
that was eventually at some point bricked up. This is a powder store. Straightforward powder store for the artillery up here. Here was where the crew or the powder would live, right next to their artillery position. Classically sandwiched by dirt mounds to either side, this is where the cannon was. See, a slightly ruined fort where we can recognize some things. So on the side, there would probably be more. So over that is this, and I can't help but to think this should be the ventilation, proving my point that it's a powder store. And I'm correct. There would have been a plate of some kind over here, so it wouldn't rain in, but that is exactly what it is. Into the root. Ooh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This goes all the way down. This goes all the way down to the ground floor. I wonder if this was ammunition left now. Hmm. And despite it being terribly overgrown, there's the next artillery position. It's just like the one we have in here. The two ramparts surrounding the fort were rebuilt into one. The roof of the barracks was reinforced with concrete. The brick escarpment pens were planned to be replaced with concrete anti-escarpment caponiers. Concrete counter escarpment was to be built in place of the brick retaining wall. Let's go see where the cannon lived and see how deep that well was or what it was. Those big steel hinges on here. Huh. Well, curious. Huh. Here it is. And here it is. And I think it was blocked at some point up there as that room was sealed. Ammunition lift next to ammunition store in here. That makes sense. And at some point in time, they stopped using the exposed gun positions up top and sealed it up. That makes sense too. And there's another previous evolution of this. Here you can see the brickwork. There was a hole that has, this has undergone at least three different evolutions of change, which is fun when you see forts that are paddling down three different wars. Or if there's one more in here, there is one more in here. And it is, haha, I was correct. The other one was previously bricked up. Post fact, here it is a straight shot up to the top. And again, here was a hole once. And this is just another store. So either side are identical. Almost looks like a technical tunnel. If we were in a different period, I would say, well, maybe this is a technical room. But we're not, so I'm not about to make that claim yet. Very nice and neat partitioning that doesn't seem to have any brick in them, although it does have a wooden door. Hmm. I get a feel this is a later addition. Well, I don't know why. 
It just doesn't feel like it was born there. Wooden dolls for attachments. Lots of electrical lighting, what have you. Another one of these little rooms with, yes, the heavy door that was on here back in the day. So there's two different evolutions going on right here from what this original one was and what it became. And this is closed off, which Surprised at another ventilation. Lots of attachments on the walls. Lots of attachments everywhere. Now the French were quite advanced with the World War I forts having electricity in them. And Feste Mutzig that was also built in the late 19th century, had electricity in it. Did the Russians build this in the late 19th century with electricity? Or was this a World War I evolution done by them? Or later? Looks like it's been cleaned up somehow. But I don't see that this would be for I don't know why there's a hole there, honestly. The tiller positions are up here on yonder hill and now we are turning a corner coming down to what I am assuming is exactly the same type of setup as we were just in although again with modifications this is completely different than what we've seen found the fort. This has been bricked up for a reason. That's obviously interesting. Ah, because it has collapsed. Now, the Germans occupied the forts after the Russians left them on the night of August 1718. Most lightly, the retreating troops blew up the important elements of the fortification. From the Yanovac group, only this oldest Fort 4 survives relatively well. But it does explain why some of the tunnels have been closed. All right, so what are we looking at? Electrical? Lots of electrical. Hinges. Electrical. Mounts for equipment. A relatively new period light. It's very hard to not imagine this used to be a, a door, a gate, an opening. It looks exactly like uh, the others, 
except here is now a window and I really don't think that was always here although the bricks look mm -hmm. bricks looks pretty authentic they it looks I can't see any reason why it wouldn't be it looks very period correct it, it really does especially with this and we can for a minute take a look at the brickwork they didn't just throw it together there's a good deal of details on the brickwork still and here clearly was a door that we can access from the other side maybe lots of stuff on the walls in this <clears throat> hmm. Lots of stuff on the walls in this. Like a significantly more than I would imagine. This really is making me think that this might have been used for something. World War II. That's ceramic. That is a ceramic pipe in the wall with a cable out. I've never seen that before. Oh no. Oh no, what am I? This is metal. That's definitely a newer evolution. These ceramic pipes, woods. Something was mounted all along this wall individually and on the other side. If I didn't know any better, I would guess that maybe there was a communication center set up in here for production. It's hard to tell, but... And that's the second we see of these. With cabling running under the floor, all the way out. Something was done here that was not part of the original architecture. And then it smells a bit of burnt wood. All right. <clears throat> okay. I have no idea what this is. It looks like fire used to, used to be fire inside. It looks like an old furnace inside, but I don't know how that's possible. So the bricks are all suited inside. this is I have never seen that before more investigation will have to be done but there isn't so much information about this of course there's not there's never information about anything I want to know about <laughs> this is rubber inlay in this one ceramic I'm intrigued I've seen one of these before as well this intrigues me this room hmm. the expanse in between the forts and the ditches are just extremely wide dimensions with artillery up here on top of the fort and here in the entrance of the fort is something that tells me the Germans were doing something here during World War II. 
little one-man guard shacks, although upside down. And you know they're not sewage pipes because, well, they're full of rebar. This was probably the original entrance to the fort. And also you see, this was the original, this was the original gate to the fort. But it is all also ringed by these fence posts that are German. World War II. There's a lot of those. As you can see, running down the side of the house here. So something happened here. So here from the entrance gate, there's of course a gatehouse. Now, why this gatehouse is newer than the fort, or period, I am wagering that this is newer, and I'm not just saying that because there's an old TV sitting there. These colors look, uh, this is more modern. And the colors are not German. These colors are like GDR, East German type colors. All right, so it's full of crap. That's something the Polish Interior Ministry is gonna have to deal with. But, okay, so it is red brick in its center. And this is not something you'll find in a civilian house. This is a well, very well built house. What I wouldn't give to find a little writing on the wall here. With bars in front of the windows? You don't put bars in front of the bathroom, do you? One man cell? Huh. Here with a clear view to the gate. The official history skips past World War II and states in the interwar period, after World War II, the fort at Genovec was occupied by the Polish army. In 1955, the fort was adapted to storage needs of the army, and the passengers that was damaged were bricked up, and the wood floor was laid. The army was stationed here until 1995, so if the Polish army could use this before and after the war, would it not make sense that the Germans could also use it during the war? So why is that part of the history of the fort completely left out? Why did the Polish army use it before without breaking up those parts that was destroyed? I don't know. So we went to investigate for ourselves. This fortress design became the norm for the Russians who built them. Two newer and one older fort in groups of three. These were constructed by General Professor Nestor Bunjiki. And he must have been a man with great foresight, as the central fortifications of the group, Fort 17, designed on a triangular plan had most of the modern underground communication corridors, semi-circular vaulted casemates, anti-splinter nets on the ceiling, heavily reinforced by rebar. The fort in Janovic was directly attacked by the German troops from 14 to 18 August 1915. The Germans occupied the forts after the Russians left them the night of August 17-18. It's not clear if the Russians managed to blow up the forts before surrender, or it was done later. However, by 1916, Fort 17, blown up it was. But an amazing construction it was, with steel and rebar, making these the most modern forts. 
of World War I, far, far ahead of their time. The trails are starting to look sort of military-like, aren't they? This is built into a foundation of this as well. And I have honestly rarely been less excited to see what's down this path. And here, once again, what do I see? Steel, rebar, cement. And we're talking World War I again. Obviously, whatever this section was, it was destroyed. But looking at this rebar, it is on the inside. This rebar is the first laid, also here. There's rebar and stone throughout this. Ain't that just special? I can't help laughing because this was built at the same time. 1913 to 15. Obviously destroyed, but two armored observation turrets were to be placed in the fort's shoulders. Unfortunately, the armor never reached the fort. There was simply no time. There's really not much information, just about all of them. I mean, look at this. Don't know where to start, so I'm just going to start somewhere. In fact, these forts were so modern, they had not even been completed by the time, can you believe this? World War I had reached here. By the time of the German attack in 1915, the steel domes had not yet been put in place, but they were planned. Here's something you don't see often. You see steel rebar cement on top of a pile of red brick. This looks like that would put in here to fill a collapsed tunnel or hole. And the interesting thing is, just to make things a little more complicated, um, this was also in the way when the Germans attacked 1939. This is where the steel dome would have been. Russian, pre-World War I. Big, heavy redstone. Dome well. Given the vintage of this fort and this construction, or these forts, that is probably one of the most surprising things I have ever seen doing this. It is thoroughly unexpected. Something this elaborate, massive, constructed on what is theoretically the Eastern Front before World War I. Interesting with stone and rebar intermixed not just cement and rebar but stones i would imagine this would actually be incredibly strong because within the cement you would have the stones to also deflect so well destroyed it was and significantly thick it was as well What's interesting about these is the barracks in this generation forts were deemed rather expensive and cumbersome to build, so they didn't build them. They planned on building the barracks outside the fort for the crews to live in until the war would necessitate them moving into the fort. And that is possibly what the foundations we saw coming in 
was the foundations of the barrack buildings. Now it's a residential area. Interesting to see, but this is fascinating. There was a caponier, but it was never built. There's some foundation of it left for the defense of the ditch, which could be part of that, but it's impossible to say, really. There's a lot of features you would see in the German forts and the Prussian forts of World War I and World War II. And these, it, it's hard not to recognize similarities. A defensive good idea is a defensive good idea, right? But still, it's just, holy crap. It's just not what you sort of expected to see on the Eastern Front, and I don't know why. Too many historians are too busy dissecting the battlefields of the Somme and Verdun, Belgium. Not many actually spent any time in the East, where, just like World War II, so much happened. I see the, this came down partially. This was an arched hallway that would lead into the ditch, I imagine. That also means we haven't seen most of this yet. Hmm. Yeah, you come out here to the ditch, sort of. Do I even care what that says? Yes, that you cannot walk uh, on this wall, yes, because they can fall down. Actually, for the first time in my life, I don't even want to. I just want to look at this enormous, what is this, five meters? Wow. Steel rebar in the construction. And I would imagine there could have been metal sheets in here but the grooves are only there not throughout could also be just natural decay and this actually seems like it came down from a heavy hit from above at one point not the thickest rebar in the world in these in here but it's there and even a little dip for somebody to dip into in case a vehicle would come through. That's actually a very, that was a very nice detail actually. The moat of the fort was defended from the front counter escarpment Caponnier, which was connected to the basement by means of a postern. By the time the war began, this shelter had not been built. In the neck part, a Caponnier was created to defend the moat. In the frontal part of the embankment, in front of the basement, an additional battle station was to be built, connected to the interior of the fort. Unfortunately, this too was also not built. Today, there's only the walled up fragments of the pavement leading to the site and the postern floor below the caponier. It would have continued there. I can't help but to think that the Germans may have taken note and picked up on some ideas from here before their World War II constructions. It just would be hard to not expect that they had. And then we come back up here again. Now, the weird thing is from here Direction Germany is actually behind me. So this must have been part of the little small triangular set of defenses in all directions because 
if they were all on a line facing the possibility of a German advance, they're pointing the wrong way. Of course, we also have to remember that the, in World War I, the Germans attacked from East Prussia and they came down towards Warsaw from the general northeastern direction. Maybe the Russians was also aware of that. All right, I would imagine that the first large enormous bunker we saw might have looked something like this. Heavily reinforced with the lip on the roof up here that's extra reinforced. And then, but not this, this is way bigger. But it looks like it generally, generally, similarly, it generally looks like a similar layout to what we just saw. Except here, not everything is destroyed, so we can go inside. Firing position for the door. That definitely looks different. Rebar sticking out of the walls. Ooh, this was a covered entrance. This brick in the middle was a covered entrance. Close defense here as well. To the other, the infantry entrance. There, firing positions there. Tons of rebar, much thicker than in the archway. And then one firing position there. There would have been a wall here with a door. And I can just barely see the indent of where the hinges would have been. So you would have been in here where you see a crap ton of shrapnel straight at this building. This is where you would have defended from there and there. Now let's just see if there's a hallway or this is just simply the defense. Ooh, there's a hallway. So there's the close defensive position. And here's a I would imagine there was a door here. Very heavy steel reinforced that has been pried away. It's the other defensive position. And then we get into what is probably where one of the steel domes would have been that were not delivered. And if they had been delivered, during the Second World War, the Germans would have probably taken them and stuck them on the Atlantic Wall and melted them down anyway. However, here you can see the dome well is actually intact. All right, so this is the inside ring where the dome would have been. Not a whole lot of features up here. But the dome well is intact. Despite the fact that when the Germans took this place, somebody threw a grenade down here. But it's got a little frag here. Good infantry tactics. When in doubt, pull the pin. See on the wall here, lots of shrapnel right here. Not further back in this room. Yeah, somebody tossed a grenade down there that exploded right here. The shrapnel didn't go much further than here. Oh yeah, so this is the defensive that punched the other direction. So I wonder if here was a door as well. I don't see why there was supposed to have been a steel dome behind me, not really a way in, but this too looked like it's been Fragged it a little bit. A little dip in the wall. Not 
vents for the entrance, steel door, and then in here would be the forces proper. And imagine to the left, when we get out here, there was a wall. This is parts of that wall. There was not an opening here, obviously. There was a wall that has been destroyed and I actually can't see any remnants of it. So there would have been a large room once you came inside the fort here. And that came down resting on that. So this is part of the original ceiling. The wall that was connected here, there's no signs of it whatsoever. Which is actually very interesting. And traditionally, as we all know, when it's got something to do with World War II, there's a tire in here. We always find tires when it's got World War II. And this is a massive tire fitting that this is a massive bunker from World War I. And I'm going to keep reminding you that this was World War I, not World War II. Despite everything in our senses, as you look around at all this steel and rebar, we'll tell you, oh, this must be World War II. But it's not. Well, of course, it's still fought World War II, quite possibly several times. 39 and 44, 45. This is the ceiling that came down. The room would have extended in under this slab. A little interior decorating, we'll fix this. The main part of the fort was a large basement, an emergency bunker located under the embankment of the front rampart. The shelter had the outline of a trapezoid resting on the neck of the fort. On the ceiling of the basement, concrete shooting positions for infantry was created. The stands were separated from each other by concrete traverses. This is the entrance roof that caved here. Not held together with a whole lot of rebar. But it's still there. It's present. There's rebar in it. The idea persisted. All right. Okay. Follow the yellow brick road. And see if we run into Dorothy. Oh, yeah. Interesting how they laid the rebar or the form to cast this upon. All right, watch your step. This, I would think, is dividing walls. They probably were the pillars underneath that wall or roof section here that slid from the explosion and they went sideways and ended up looking like two gigantic blocks of Lego. And the other one could have been here. It, is, it never ceases to amaze me what explosives can actually do. Oh, it just got so much more fun. I see tunnels. Now the crew of this fort could stay in the basement. However, they were supposed to live at the main fort, in this case, fort number four. This was to serve as the residential and storage fort. I like to save the best for last. It's, it's a weird thing. I mean, 
so this is the direction of the entrance it's kind of hard to show you the lobby and somewhere someone lost their doormat here in 1915 or 39 I mean with the fighting for Warsaw in 39 it would almost be strange if not some Polish soldiers were stationed here at least and it would be strange if the Germans did not remember because they remembered they made lots and lots of notes the Germans did where everything was so they knew very well about this place and it will be surprising if that was not on the radar of places just to bomb just a little i'm guessing this is a separation between two castings i don't know what else it will be but it's very smooth there's nothing that connected those which is strange So this was generally down the, leading down the tunnel to the entrance. That gives us the fun and enviable task of finding out where it went. There are times when I say, I don't want to walk the places that are flooded. I will swim to the end of this thing if it was. So, I am imagining that this was simply torn out from an explosion. I don't know what else would hollow out this section. And you see the roof is pretty rough. Of course, the floor was elevated by stone by four layers of stone floor? Four layers of stone floor held up the foundations. Well, that's intriguing on his own. All right. So, what's that cut out? was bricked up at some point. Interesting cutout. If there were no caserne, no barracks in here, you would have a whole lot of creature comforts you didn't need. For instance, like, you know, heating. I think this was where the crew was expected to sit if they were on duty but not active. And certainly that's been fragged as well. But the back wall here, just like the floor, is stone and cement. And almost <laughs> thinking about this, leading straight back down the hallway to the outside in one straight line, one would wonder if some enterprising German gunner didn't send a shell straight in here with a puck or even in 39 with a tank because it's a straight shot to the outside and that could explain the damage in this section but from what I understand this is the one place where the crews could actually sit and rest in between because the barrack areas were outside although they were practically not finished by the time the fighting broke out here And something completely took out this floor. It's funny, what's here is what's not here. There's four layers of stone floor here. It even demolished, there's no signs of any single free laying stones anywhere. Just like the outside wall that is completely missing. Somebody must have removed these stones for, I don't know, probably private construction. They incorporated them in the garden wall or something. It's just interesting that it's completely missing. And also, 
I am imagining that there would have been a floor above here. There almost had to have been a room or a floor above here. There wouldn't have been a cathedral-like height here. There would be a, no reason for that, plus it would be rather unsafe. And again, there's no resemblance, no parts of that rubble either. This could also very simply have been, at some point in time, there could have been a museum association that was active at one point that just simply cleaned it up. That happens. That's usually how it happens. A little rebar sticking out there. These are firing positions. Indispersed for machine guns and rifle fire above the fort. And you had the two steel domes. And I would imagine there would be some sort of artillery here as well because it couldn't just be a blocking position, counting on a couple of domes and rifle fire. Firing positions for infantry. Quite elaborate, quite high up, actually. Massive, massive, massive. This is not what you see for World War I. Now the guardrails obviously was put on after the war so nobody would fall down while watching these. So this would be the frontal part of the firing position. And looking at the frontal part of the firing position, somebody most certainly fired upon it. That's the direct fire, that's direct fire, those in there direct fire. This fortress fought, this fort definitely fought. Lots of impacts on the front of facade, lots of impacts. Lots of impacts. Be interesting to start digging them out, see what kind of shell it was. This is a roof section. Now you see the cross section of just exactly how thick this was. And that is damn impressive for World War I. How they poured it, I would be really curious to see. And this section have come down. But there's an entryway in here. We would have to walk on. What we're looking at would be the floor. That would probably where infantry would come out and get to their positions up here on the roof. Let's see the fighting parapets here, where soldiers would be stationed. And okay, I thought there might have been a dome here. This is not a dome, this is just the wall that has come away. That's why the fighting apartment is offset. They built these in sections, like piece by piece. They poured them in sections that were separated. That's where the Germans in World War II did it differently. They were all, there wasn't gonna be a split like this. They were still connected interlaced with rebar and there were rebar in these. So why didn't they pour the sections and still connect the rebar between them? That's sort of silly. But at this point in time, as impressive as this was, I'm not going to give them any grief for anything they did. Do you remember the World War I test fort? There's some of this in that, except this is way bigger. Yeah, the staircase goes all the way down to where the flat was. It's actually interesting. That is a little bit of a throwback to an old castle. I almost have to say. We would run up on your ramparts and fight. Impact.
Oh, look, somebody broke the building in half. Don't you just hate when that happens? So, this would be the wartime exit for the soldiers to run out on their ramparts from here. And this is the tunnel where they would have been waiting. So what is missing here is a staircase. Unless the staircase is here, in which case, well, it's not. But it sounded good in my head. <laughs> now this room would have held a staircase and probably a landing I ordered them to let the troops up here and out here. This is actually a very simple fort. Although there must have been some artillery emplacements as well. I guess you've been here. Not having been here. <laughs> and again, you look at the lots of shrapnel, lots of direct impacts on here. This was a fighting fort. No doubt about that. I wonder if there was a gate or it would have been shot up behind me. Huh. I actually don't see that many impacts unless this is just one large impact, which is also possible. Here we go. There's impacts in the wall. And here's impacts in the wall. And here's no wall, so, well, you get the idea. This is the frontal section of the infantry firing positions. And you can see it's been heavily hit, unpacked before it eventually blew up and fell backwards, but this is how tall it was. And then here, when you get into the actual fort, it was connected over there. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebnus nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing, trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that I use for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.